It's a pleasure to celebrate Iniki at this moment of her retirement. In Iniki, I found the perfect colleague and collaborator for the Gendered Innovations Project. For several years, we Skyped weekly to plan and push the project forward. We agree, I think, that what we appreciate most about each other is that when we say we will do something, we actually do it. Iniki works with great intelligence, knowledge, and impeccable judgment. Iniki asked me to introduce you to the Gendered Innovations Project, which I do with pleasure. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. Ten drugs were recently withdrawn from the U.S. market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those pose greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of euros to develop, but when they fail, they cause death and human suffering. We can't afford to get it wrong. Doing research right saves lives and money. An analysis of the U.S. Women's Health Initiative Hormone Therapy Trial a large government-funded trial done in the 1990s found that for every dollar spent, 140 were returned. The study also saved lives, 76,000 fewer cases of cardiovascular disease, 126 fewer breast cancers, 145,000 more quality-adjusted life years, and while most of the results were positive, the analysis did find 263,000 more osteoporotic fractures. It's crucially important to get the research right, and this is the goal of the Gendered Innovations Project. This project develops state-of-the-art methods of sex and gender analysis and provides case studies to illustrate how gender analysis leads to discovery and innovation. Gendered Innovations was developed over the past four years through a series of international collaborative workshops funded by the European Commission. Iniki and I worked fruitfully with Vivian willis mazici from the Commission, who is also with you today. Thank you, Vivian. The project was also funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation and by Stanford University. These workshops uniquely brought together 60 basic scientists and gender experts from each specific field treated. All materials are peer-reviewed. In sum, gendered innovations harness the creative power of sex and gender analysis for discovery. I'll give you just two examples of gendered innovation, some of the aha moments from our gendered innovation workshops. Our first example comes from cells and tissues, looking specifically at stem cell therapy. Let's go back to why 10 drugs were withdrawn from the market. These days, as I said, developing a drug can cost billions of euros. There are many reasons why drugs fail, and fail more often for women. One reason is that most research is done in males, whether humans, animals, or cells and tissues. This study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley. It shows the sex of the animals used in research. The blue indicates that males are used more than females in all areas except reproduction. But what I'm interested in is the gray area, where the sex of the animal was not recorded. This is research money wasted. You might as well throw it out the window. A similar study was done at Mayo Clinic on cells and tissues also in 2011. And look at the gray area. The sex of the cell is almost never reported. Again, this is research money wasted. Let's look at stem cells and let me take you to our website. Here you see the methods that are tools for researchers and here you see our case study in buckets. And I'm going to go to science and stem cells and then to full case study. Why might the sex of the cell be relevant? Researchers show that there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. This slide shows stem cells taken from muscle tissue and indicates that female cells are more regenerative or active than male cells. Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell. 
we have a world-class researcher at Stanford doing some research on Parkinson's disease using all female stem cells. This is an arbitrary decision on her part, and it means that in the discovery phase, she will not see anything unique to male stem cells, nor will she and her team detect important differences in function between male and female cells. Not considering the sex of the cell can lead to failed research. An international team from Norway and Australia worked with stem cells in mice. They appropriately used male and female mice. Using both animals in basic research is excellent design. But they used all female stem cells. Again, this was an arbitrary and unconscious decision. The result was that their male mice died and they didn't know why. Eventually, through a gendered innovations workshop in Norway, the team realized they should consider also the sex of the stem cells. They found that sex matching of donor and recipient yielded the best result. So the idea is that you match. They found that matching the male to male and the female to female yielded the best result. But all combinations should be tested before being ruled out. But of course, it's never that easy. In addition to analyzing sex, we need to bring in another gendered innovations method, analyzing factors intersecting with sex. In the case of stem cells, these factors may include cell type, the disease being treated, and other variables, hormonal, immunological, and environmental. My final example today explores assistive technology for the elderly. And believe me, the robots are coming. We need to get the gender right for them to be effective. This case study, and now I'm going to engineering and assistive technology for the elderly, and again, full case study. This case study has to do with aging. The world population will age dramatically by 2050, a problem for Europe and a priority for Horizon 2020. Large elderly populations will place a growing strain on human caregivers, health, and social systems. Here we explore assistive technology for the elderly and look at the value added of considering both sex and gender when designing these technologies. Assistive technologies support independent living for the elderly. When developing these technologies, it's important to look at sex differences. Women, for example, tend to live longer but may have more disease. Men, for example, tend to lose their hearing early. And in addition to looking at sex differences, it's also important to look at gender differences. As they age, men and women may have different partnering patterns, experience in household management, and receptivity to technology. Elderly women, for example, more often live alone. Our engineering checklist and methods encourage researchers to analyze how sex and gender interact in individual women and men so that researchers can design the most effective and marketable product. Designers want their products to be useful and appealing to both women and men. Gender issues become important as assistive technologies become more personalized. For example, a number of robots are being developed. One is a robotic nurse named Cody that can bathe elderly people. Bathing will involve a very intimate relationship between human and machine. Designers need to get the gender of the machine right. Another assistive robot is Herb, the home exploring robot butler who can fetch household items for you, fetch you a cup of tea, remind you to take your medicine, or even clean up the kitchen. If there's a robot to clean up the kitchen, I'm ordering it immediately. As these robots enter our lives, we humans will gender them. Studies of machine voices, synthetic voices, that is to say machine-generated voices, show that human listeners assign gender to machine voices, that is to say we interpret these machine voices as the voice of a man or a woman, even when designers may have tried to create a gender-neutral voice. 
as soon as humans interpret a voice as masculine or feminine, we tend to apply all of our cultural stereotypes to the machine. Considering sex and gender when designing new assistive technologies will be one important factor to ensure that the products are successful with all users. There are many gendered innovations we could discuss. Through the Gendered Innovation Project, we developed 23 case studies, which are specific examples treating different subfields of science and engineering, from osteoporosis research in men, to nutrigenomics, to climate change, just to name a few. Designing sex and gender analysis into research and innovation is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technology. As our case studies demonstrate, integrating sex and gender analysis into research enhances excellence and sparks creativity. Sex and gender analysis adds value to society by making research responsive to a broad and diverse user base. Let me conclude with a quick look at policy, which we also cover on our website. Policy is one driver of innovation and can help encourage scientists and engineers integrate gender analysis into their research. Interlocking policies need to address grant, granting agencies, hiring committees, editors of peer-reviewed journals, industry leaders, and educators. Let's look first at granting agencies. Granting agencies can ask applicants to explain how sex and gender analysis is relevant to their proposed research. And this is where it gets exciting. In December last year, the European Commission launched Horizon 2020. The EC identified 136 fields of science and technology where gender analysis could benefit research including computer hardware and architecture, nanotechnology, oceanography, geosciences, organic chemistry, aeronautics, space medicine, biodiversity, ecology, and many others. And for these uh, applications, the PI must explain how sex and gender will be integrated into their research. The European Commission is the global leader in this policy area. We want to watch now carefully the execution of these policies. Other granting agencies include the Canadian Institutes for Health Research that have requested since 2010 that applicants consider sex and gender in their research. However, this policy does not yet have teeth because the sex and gender component is not a review criteria. Also, the Gates Foundation has required applicants to consider gender in agricultural research since 2008. Foundation program officers also offer assistance in incorporating gender analysis into research. And now the newest aspect, the U.S. National Institutes of Health are bringing online in 2015 requirements for sex analysis in preclinical research. That is to say research in cells, tissues, and animals. Inaki asked me to say a few words about what's happening at NIH. In 1993, NIH required that women and minorities be included in clinical research. These requirements apply to humans only, and we have the untenable situation that candidate drugs and devices were tested on humans, but had not earlier been tested in animals. This can be extremely dangerous and may explain why so many drug candidates fail. Now, in 2015, NIH will be requiring sex-inclusive research across the board. This is new and requires lots of training, thought, and funding. A workshop on methods and techniques for such work was held October 20th. You can watch the seven and a half hour webcast. It's extremely informative with many top researchers discussing their results. The final hour of discussion uh, concerns how to integrate this work throughout NIH. The second area of policy important to implementing sex and gender analysis is peer-reviewed journals, and let's go to that portal. 
Editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals can require sophisticated sex and gender analysis when selecting papers for publication. On the GI website, we include a list of journals and their policies. No one need reinvent the wheel. You can just look at the policies here. I call your attention to the very best journal editorial policies to date that I am aware of from the Clinical Orthopedic and Related Research Journal. I encourage you to read their editorial announcing their policies issued from 2014. And the big news is that Science and Nature will be announcing new guidelines the first week in November. By the time you are hearing this, you will know what they are. Finally, we need to integrate knowledge of sex and gender into higher education. Universities must integrate the results of gendered innovation into their curricula. This is especially important for medical schools such as Maastricht, and I know Inneke has been working on this. Innovation is what makes the world tick. And as I hope I've begun to show, gendered innovations spark creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas to research. Can we afford to ignore such opportunities?